Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, this is the uh, Cloud Native Networking State of the Union a panel discussion. Uh, my name is Raghavan Srinivas, and I'm going to be the moderator for the panel. Um, I really appreciate uh, you, you know, the uh, rest of the panelists who are up at uh, you know, different times of the day. Um, but, but we really wanted to do this as a live panel, um, and hopefully um, the next conference uh, we, can, we can all be face to face. Uh, having said that, uh, welcome again, and uh, I will uh, go through, do a quick round of introductions, uh, and the rest of it is going to be driven by you, the audience. Um, so you're going to be asking questions in the uh, um, um, tab, and, and we are going to be looking at it. Uh, you know, if you like a particular question, you can go ahead and start it, and, and that way I can determine which question, um, you know, is probably more popular. Um, so having said that, again, uh, thanks to the panelists, and uh, my, let me go through the introductions. Uh, my name is Raghavan uh, Srinivas. I go by RAGS. Uh, I represent InfoQ in this panel. Uh, my interests are several, um, you know, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Particularly, I come from a developer perspective. Uh, I still feel like development on Kubernetes is, is kind of a pain. Um, so I like scaffold, draft, and so on. Um, so big fan of all of those. Uh, I like to kind of keep this minimal. So let's go to the next panelist. Hey, and thanks for everyone. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That's Tim. Go ahead, Tim. I saw my name. Yeah, sorry, we pat, we jumped right over Christian. We'll jump back. Hi, uh, I'm Tim. I work at uh, Google. I've been working on Kubernetes for um, a few years now. Uh, mostly, I spend my time in networking and cluster, multi-cluster, node, and uh, infrastructural topics. Perfect. Sorry, Christian, didn't mean to skip you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you all for uh, joining or joining live and watching this, uh, and of course for the panelists. But I'm 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 Christian. I work at Solo. Uh, my interests are on uh, sort of the Kubernetes level and application level and then up from there. So um, how application networking, how service mesh, how these types of things uh, uh, improve one's platform. All right, back to them. Hi everyone. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I am very new to Solo. I joined Solo about two months ago. I'm currently the director of open source at Solo. Prior to joining Solo, I worked for IBM for a long time, contributor and speaker to KubeCon. I've been uh, contributing to Istio project for a long time. My primary interest is Istio service mesh and help our user adopting service mesh. I'm currently a maintainer on the project, also a TSC member. Perfect. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. My name is okay. Alyssa. Uh, I am also at Google, where I've been working on front end proxying for about 14 years. Uh, on the GFE team, I launched HTTP2 and HTTP3 at Google, so worldwide. And then I switched over to working on Envoy, where I'm now a senior maintainer. So I'm very focused on the Envoy project, um, both as a server and as a client now, Envoy Mobile, and kind of network scalability in general. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. So feel free again, you know, as a participating audience, um, you know, thanks for watching and, um, you know, feel free to start some questions. Uh, I already see a few, um, um, you know, in the Q and A, um, but but let me start with some um, questions that I had kind of lined up. So one one question. This is this is the you know um, for everyone on the panel, um, and we can we can just go uh, you know Christian first, then Tim, then uh, Lynn, and then Alyssa, if you don't mind. Um, was the original requirements or assumptions for network design for Kubernetes uh, really too simplistic? Um, and it's becoming increasingly hard uh, for Kubernetes clusters to scale to, you know, hundreds of thousands. Is that, um, you know, what do you have to say about that? So let's let's go um, 
you know, with Christian Fust? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I'm, I'm going to have a frame of reference that uh, might, <laughs> might, might not um, appreciate the assumptions in that question. <laughs> but um, so I, I, first of all, I do think that the, uh, that Kubernetes did a, an amazing job at two things. One, staying, trying, trying to be as simple, uh, you know, uh, upfront so that, you know, you can bring your applications to Kubernetes. They're not going to be a lot of uh, uh, complexity and, um, and hoops to jump through to get it to Kubernetes. The second thing is building the APIs in the right place so that people can extend it. Um, so, I, and, and then I guess, in, in so far that we need to scale to hundreds of thousands of nodes, I guess I'm of the opinion or I'm working with organizations in an enterprise where uh, some of them have deployed, maybe not hundreds of thousands, but thousands and thousands of nodes. And they are, you know, we're, we're, we're almost trying to redesign that and go toward uh, maybe smaller, smaller Kubernetes clusters. <clears throat> but that's, that's, that's my point of view here. So, uh, as someone whose fingerprints are on some of those early design decisions, um, uh, I thank you for for calling out the, the main goal, which was to keep it simple. Um, the you know, the the assumption at the beginning of the whole Kubernetes experience was to make it not really surprising for people who are coming to it from a, a VMish world, and so it wanted to feel sort of the same but be different. Um, you know, here we are now, six seven years later. Um, and we've got a lot of new workloads that we're trying to bring into Kubernetes. Uh, and it, honestly, if you told me seven years ago that we'd be talking about the things we're talking about now, I would not have believed you. Um, so the requirements have shifted. Um, I do think uh, that Kubernetes is struggling a little bit to provide the primitives that we need for some of the higher level um, primitives that we wanna build. Things like telecom are bringing a lot of really interesting and complicated requirements uh, that we're, we're slowly understanding and being able to adjust, but it, but it is a slow process. Yeah, I would add um, from an application developer perspective, right? When they start to look at Kubernetes, they would immediately see a bunch of challenges for them because um, all they care about is going to be, you know, I have multiple services as I'm moving from my monolithic to multiple microservices. How am I going to, you know, handle my service connectivities as my service is going to be distributed to multiple nodes in Kubernetes and maybe multiple um, zones and regions. So the network is not always reliable as monolithic from their perspective. So what does Kubernetes do for them in that perspective? I, I think today it's, it's not clear. That's why people start to rely on a higher level technology like service mesh to help to tackle these problems from a framework perspective because people know they didn't want to solve these problems in their application code they could, but it's really costly. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of launch and iterate. So to me, the fact that we're hitting these scaling boundaries is a sign of Kubernetes success. You know, there's the iconic you know, 640K ought to be enough for anyone. I don't think that scaling up in that particular direction was expected. You know, it was like trying to create a successful ecosystem and then you never know what, you know, what payloads and what infra you know, infrastructure people are gonna be using it for in years. So, so again, with kind of the launch and iterate mindset, I think that you're always gonna hit scalability, you know, blocks and you just have to figure out how to iterate to get around them. Absolutely, okay. So I know questions are starting to trickle in. Um, you know, uh, feel free to uh, add questions, and uh, you know we are here live to answer those uh, questions that you have. So let's start with the top one: um, Is the status of IPv6 only now mature in Kubernetes? And what about direct connectivity to pods and our containers um, in pods instead of connecting through the IP address of the host? This is from Jan Hugo. Jan, um, thanks for asking the question. Um, where do we want to start? Who wants to take this? I have a lot of context. I, I can speak to the Perfect. state of Kubernetes. Um, 
it might even still be premature to say that um, IPv6 support is mature. Uh, dual stack support is beta now, so it's more mature than it has been in the past. Um, it's not going GA in the next release, but hopefully the release after that. Um, the uh, to the rest of the question, you know, direct connectivity. Kubernetes was actually built to assume direct connectivity. Um, it was only worked into overlays and host-based proxying uh, out of necessity. Um, so there are environments, um, you know, I'll pick on my favorite one, like Google Cloud, uh, which build pod connectivity into the VPC network automatically. Um, that's not always practical, not for all customers and not all environments. So, uh, you know, we do allow other models. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, rise of IPv6, huh, 20 years later, the rise of IPv6 will uh, enable more people to embrace that model. The IPv4, you know, uh, IP address limitations uh, have been have been a real problem for people. Okay. Anybody else wants to add anything? No. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Um, Oh, I, I skipped over one. Um, it looks like at least a dozen SIG network enhancements are slated already for 1.22. Uh, can you address the continued fast pace of change and where you see Kubernetes networking going? And, and I think this is a classic, you know, too much happening versus, you know, too little happening, right? You know, where is the happy medium, I guess, right? Um, so who wants to take this question? I know that you know uh, many of you are kind of part of the um, SIG network, right? So uh, should we start um, with somebody else other than Tim? <laughs> I, I can take an initial crack. Um, all right. So 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 first of all, I do think it's uh, there. There are a lot of uh, networking initiatives going on, a lot of uh, um, things happening in the networking. Uh, working group, but um, I think that's good. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of inter, iteration and a lot of uh, innovation happening in those spaces. And um, like, like Alyssa said, when you get to those points where you hit bottlenecks, you hit scalability issues and so on, things become really interesting. Um, one of the ones that I'm particularly interested in is, is, the, is the gateway API, which will, I guess, supplant maybe the <laughs> ingress v1. Um, and that's, that's one of those things that's kind of been a long time coming. Um, but yeah, th th there's, there's a lot of really good stuff happening in the, in the working group. Yeah, I guess I would add that, you know, there are interesting things uh, in addition to the gateway API, it's like the multi-cluster service API, you know, the Istio community is looking at implement that. We know there are challenges with running services in multi-cluster where we want to um, have ability for mesh uh, admin or the service owner to be able to control what are the services they want to expose outside of their cluster, what are the services they want to import into their cluster. So that's really interesting. And I know, Tim, you are also driving an effort to replace the sidecar um, cap, which we had a huge interest from the Istio community perspective, because um, there are a lot of a user wants to be able to precisely control the proxy start sequence, uh, the sidecar proxy corresponding to their application container in a service mesh environment. So that's super interesting to us. Um, from our perspective, you know, being working on Istio for a long time, we realized certainly an uh, item on the roadmap for a particular release uh, sometimes doesn't mean it's actually committed to the release. It actually means you know, making enough progress and hopefully reach some stage uh, for that release, but not necessarily, you know, it's a hard thing, you know, the release is not going to hold up for the completion. So I'm I actually really curious uh, to hear from Tim on this too. Alyssa, do you have anything to say or, um, you know? Um... I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's covered there. Okay, uh, Tim, you want to final thoughts? Sure, <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll be quick on, on this one. SIG Network has been super, super active uh, the last uh, three or four cycles, uh, which is great. Um, there's a lot of caps listed in say this next release. Um, 
some of them are huge, like dual stack. Well, actually, dual stack isn't fundamentally changing in the next release, but some of the some of the in progress work is huge. Like dual stack touches every part of Kubernetes, um, and uh, therefore it's taken a very long time for us to build our confidence in both the API and the implementation. Um, many of these caps though are, are much smaller in scope, right? They're adding a field to the API, which allows load balancer control from the cloud provider in a, in a very nuanced way. Um, so I wouldn't be overwhelmed by the sheer number of them, um, you know, but we're, ta we're tackling a bunch of different issues um, sort of all at the same time and in different places. Um, that includes uh, things like topology and topology aware uh, routing of traffic. Um, I saw another question in the, in the Q&A sort of about that. Um, so we're adding more capabilities there and that'll become default eventually. Um, things like gateway, I think is a huge effort, um, but actually kind of outside the core of Kubernetes, right? It's all happening as, as custom resources. Um, so that's sort of an interesting proof uh, of, the, of the viability of custom resources, honestly. Um, we're also looking at things like uh, major IPAM overhauls so that we can be more um, functional in restricted environments like on-premises. Um, yes, Lynn, uh, I'm very interested in the container lifecycle problem. Um, it is a very uh, complicated problem that works across a couple of the biggest and most busy SIGs. So it's been a little bit difficult to get um, traction on, on how to proceed with that. Um, somebody took the idea that we wrote and started writing a cap for it. Um, I'm, I'm a little wary because we don't have sort of alternate ideas explored yet, um, but I definitely want to see the uh, sidecar lifecycle problem tackled um, in a holistic way. So there's, there is a lot going on, but don't just look at the numbers. Also, you know, spend a little time to understand the scope of each because they're not that big. It's not the classic, you know, it's not the quantity, it's the quality, right? <laughs> All right. Um, Ryan is very popular or this question is, you know, is really, um, you know, uh, very critical. Uh, what are your thoughts on BPF, uh, EBBP, EBPF in relation to Kubernetes networking. Good, bad, ugly, scary. So who I wants could to take be that? one pass on that. I'm gonna go with good and scary. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're adding something like this, it's it's really hard to get it right, especially get it right at first pass to make sure that you're not setting up your filters wrong or you're not allowing the permissions to get screwed up and traffic to go to the wrong place. Um, but again, you know, in a, in a prior life, I was you know TL of Google's HTTP three effort or quick as it was at the time and. Um, we're getting quick support in Envoy, hopefully later today. Uh, and you don't want to use HTTP3 without BPF. It's just that the kernel doesn't, doesn't throw packets around fast enough. So I'm hoping that, that soon this will spread out to the entire Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, and you're going to want BPF to get it right and really have kind of the next generation of high-speed networking. Yeah, I think that uh, what Alyssa says really resonated to me as well. When I first looked at the question, I was like, okay, it's great. I love, you know, all the momentum behind eBPF and all the powerful thing they provide, but it's really scary. You know, as individual developer, I don't think I want to touch eBPF, right? I really would rather have, a, you know, a trustworthy vendor to provide solution for eBPF and then for average developer to consume because it's hard of messing up the kernel. You know, it's going to be super hard to de debug. I think it's going to be even harder to debug than Envoy proxy, which many of you probably agree it could be very hard to debug also. Christian, Tim, any thoughts? I'll, I'll just throw in that it, I, I think there's a lot of excitement around it, uh, a, lot of, a lot of potential power. Um, I'm not seeing too many enterprises go down that path just yet. There are a lot of people are asking questions, um, but I'm not seeing that much uh, in the wild, at least, uh, uh, people going all in with it. I, you know, it's it's funny to call eBPF young because it's been around for years and years, but in the sort of overall adoption curve of these sorts of things, it is pretty young still. Um, I'm super excited about eBPF, um, not from an end user point of view. I don't think end users should ever see or know about it. Um, I'm more excited in the opportunities that it opens, sort of the, uh, the, the adjacency of the possible, right? Now that we've got this, we can open a whole bunch of new doors and explore a whole bunch of new things that we haven't been able to explore before because they weren't really pragmatic 
in terms of implementation, right? The, the, the floor has been raised in terms of what we can expect out of the capabilities of a Kubernetes cluster, or at least it's on its way up. Um, and so, uh, so I'm just excited at sort of what is the next round of, of ideas and APIs that we can add that we just couldn't even consider last year. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Ricardo. Uh, how do you see the current multi-cluster or hybrid cluster options? And do you think there should be more support for this use case directly in Kubernetes? Um, obviously, I think he's referring to the networking aspects of this, right? Um, so I have a multi-cluster or a hybrid hybrid cluster, and and what should Kubernetes networking um, or how how does it need to be enhanced um, if if it should be? Is my reading of the question is that is that accurate? That's how I read it. Yeah. Um, um, all right. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start, but then I'll, I'll hand off quickly because I'm actually really curious to hear uh, everybody else's thoughts. Um, Kubernetes is a cluster oriented solution. It is the scope of the uh, the boundaries are growing a little bit. Um, I I do think that some of the capabilities to enable multi-cluster are going to be or are starting to be ingested into the sort of scope of Kubernetes. Um, and we have service imports and service exports now, which is a way to publish services across clusters. Um, but it's explicitly an API and not an implementation because the, uh, the variety of sorts of ways to make this happen uh, are so broad. Um, and I think Gateway also plays to this. It's a, a more neutral way to describe the sort of doors between services. Um, and so I, I do think that multi-cluster is sort of going to become the norm. Everybody is going to be a multi-cluster user at some point, um, whether that's just in terms of, you know, upgrading a cluster by creating a new one and flipping the traffic over or, or by people who do geographic uh, distribution or blast radius or whatever reasons. Um, I do think multi-cluster is becoming the norm. Um, I want to be careful that Kubernetes doesn't try to be everything to everyone and try to absorb every single API out there. Um, so service import, service export was a very tactical, small step to cover one use case that just kept coming up over and over and over again. Um, the rest we're going to be super careful about. This is where I think service mesh becomes a really interesting uh, way to explore it because you have a lot more freedom as you move up the stack. This is where I want to hear everybody else. Gotcha. Uh, I think there is another question by Gary, which kind of feeds into the same thing as well, which is kind of like many cloud providers offer multi-zone deployment within a region, and um, you know some offer multi-cluster networking for clusters deployed across regions. Is there something from a networking perspective again which stops people from doing that? So just factor that into you know when you're answering the uh, the original question. Yeah, if I could just build a little bit on on what Tim said. Um, at least we've been looking at it from the application level. How how do applications communicate with each other that might be deployed across different clusters um, for various you know regulatory compliance type reasons or you know scaling reasons and isolation reasons and so on. Um, so I, I do agree that it, it is, or at least will become the norm if it's not right now. Um, but like I said, we've been looking at it from the application perspective and you know, we're, we're heavily involved in, in service mesh. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe Lynn will say a few words about what, you know, how Istio plays into that as well. But at, at sort of a high level, um, we, we see applications can be deployed on Kubernetes, that can be deployed on VMs, that can be deployed on-prem, that can be deployed in public cloud. Um, and the, the way we try to solve that is at, at an abstraction. So what is multi-cluster? What is multi-infrastructure? What, is, what does that networking look like? Um, well, the applications need to be able to uh, exchange messages with, with each other. Um, and so what are, the, what are the solutions that support that? Service mesh is one and, and, and there's others. But Yeah, just to add on to that, certainly multi-cluster service API, I think it's super interesting for service mesh because I don't believe you would be using Kubernetes along with uh, implementation of multi-cluster service API without service mesh. The reason is you could 
use that, assuming there's an implementation out there. But the problem is you have to solve all that problem that service mesh is going to solve for you. I mean, it, it, when you talk about connectivity, service connectivity among multi-cluster, how are you going to secure, you know, the communication? How are you going to, you know, do like uh, low balance or failover, you know, prefer local and failover to remote? How are you doing traffic shifting? So a set of challenges is going to come to you as, as a service owner. And then it makes sense just to build on top of what service mesh already provides. So Tim, to your point, I, I, I almost feel, you know, that API is really designed with service mesh in mind. Okay. Yeah, um, to talk about the lens point, I think, I think it's basically natural that people are going to want to have heterogeneous setups. Like home, you're going to end up having a much cleaner solution and in infrastructure if you can be homogeneous but it's, it's just not a reality. But but when you have these mixed sort of deployments, it, it does get hard managing it and making sure that like you understand the behavioral changes of like what traffic is going where and why and how things, you know, how, how this health checks versus that health checks and it, it gets really complicated. And so it's always interesting to see how the ecosystem evolves uh, from like everything kind of looks like this to the reality of everything is mixed and complicated to the reality of, but I just want to manage it one way. How do I do that? Great. I was going to bubble this question up anyway, because this is a little bit more tactical, but but seems like it's getting more rewards, um, which is uh, with port security policy, PSP being deprecated in Kubernetes 1.2.1, um, there seems like there are some security gaps with Kubernetes networking. Um, are we seeing more clients adopt, uh, you know, op uh, OPA, uh, Open Policy Agent, to the right, uh, to fill these gaps? Um, who wants to start? I don't mind starting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't stand a void. Um, I, I personally, I've seen a ton more uh, uptake of OPA and using that for uh, much more sophisticated policies in the last year. It's been a very noticeable uptake um, from what I've seen. Um, there are, I mean, security is such a complicated and broad problem. It's hard to, to talk about what even network security means. I see there are some other questions in the Q&A that talk about um, identity. And I think that's an important part that, you know, Kubernetes doesn't address very well, uh, currently anyway. Um, and so, uh, yes, I'm seeing a lot more people uptake on OPA for locking down things like the Kubernetes APIs, who can do what with which resources and, and those sorts of capabilities. And in fact, we found uh, a handful of things that uh, were added to Kubernetes with best intentions, but turn out to be um, very sharp knives um, and that most people don't need. And so we're recommending that a lot of people just turn those you know, facets of those APIs off um, or put them behind uh, site-specific OPA policies to control those sorts of APIs. Okay, anybody else want to add? Otherwise we can actually go to this question, which is, will Ingress or Gateway ever, uh, ever become identity aware? Um, this is from Martin, um, who wants to take a stab at that. Lynn, you wanna go? Well, I would say, gosh, I would say the ingress is kind of becoming identity or well, at least within the service mesh environment, right? Because within the service mesh environment, we actually give the identity to the ingress gateway from like we, the control plane of the service mesh provisions the identity for all the services within the mesh and the gateway, at least the inner, uh, I would say the inner portion of the gateway, you know, it has this identity entity as it's interact with the rest of the services in the mesh. And I guess I'll just add that um, uh, I, I, when I thought about identity, I thought about, uh, I guess I immediately thought end user, like the requests that are coming in to, to, to the gateway um, in an ingress setting. Um, and and I, what I would expect is that those, th those types of things would be delegated to, um, you know, I am and I, I, identity provider solutions that, but that it would be able to uh, uh, provide identity for, for, for those end users. 
Okay. Anybody else it's, want to add? Yeah. It's very, yeah, it's, it's very difficult because Kubernetes is so broad and it is on so many platforms, it's difficult to make assumptions about identity and what's carried on the wire and what isn't, um, which it makes it sort of a, a limiting factor for APIs like Ingress, which try to be very compatible um, and uh, identity doesn't map very well in there. I do hope that we can make it better and make it more identity aware. Um, this comes back to something like VPF where you know, maybe we can do really creative things at the network level without doing full encapsulations uh, that give us a sense of identity so that we can at least uh, enable some increased sense of policy around identities. Everything else at Kubernetes is at layer three and layer four, which is really just not identity aware. Um, I wanna be very careful how we open those doors, um, but I do hope that we can find some way to do that better. Perfect. Uh, I know that we are coming up to less than four minutes. Uh, I really want to bring up this last question, which is kind of a little bit uh, forward thinking. Um, and basically what it is, is, uh, you know, again, going back to the original simplistic design, Kubernetes handles simple networking things pretty well. But is it keeping up with the capabilities people need in the 2020s, um, you know, 2030s, whatever? Um, where is the line for what capabilities Kubernetes should grow to support and what should remain out of bounds? How far are we from that line? Um, maybe we'll start with Alyssa and kind of um, go. So, so, to, so to how close we are to, to done, I, I will say, I, I don't think it's ever gonna be done, right? I think that there's always gonna be some evolution of, oh, and now we have this new type of deployment and we have this new setup and, and such. So I think that that's gonna continue to evolve. And I think, you know, for, for what's added next, I think it's just gonna be based on demand. I, I, largely, especially with open source projects like this, I, I don't, there, there isn't always an easy roadmap, right? It's based on, on what people use as deployments and what innovation there is in the entire space, not just the project. So um, I, I feel like there's maybe like a feel for a roadmap for like a year or so out, but beyond that, I, I don't know. I don't know if other people have a sense for that. All right, Christian, you wanna go next? Yeah, I'll just say one thing I absolutely love about uh, Kubernetes is that they, the, the community, the project, they, they drew a line and they said, this is, this is where we're gonna live and we're gonna allow other things to sprout off or extend in and uh, you know, with the APIs, custom resources, all that stuff. I think we'll probably see more optimizations in Kubernetes to continue to support that model. Um, but I, I think that is what will enable the, the, the drive to all these various uh, either niche or um, not originally thought of uh, networking models. Okay, um, Lynn, you wanna go next? Well, I would say, you know, the some of the challenges with the service owner running their services in Kubernetes really open up the doors for other solutions like service mesh to shine in this space, right? So it's actually really nice, like Christian said, uh, Kubernetes are not going after those set of problems and leave to another solution or architecture to solve that problem. So I, I think that's really nice. And, uh, you know, we have so many vendors in service mesh community these days trying to compete in that space. So that's really interesting. What I would really love to see, you know, I actually really love Kubernetes. It's become so boring that people really view Kubernetes as infrastructure now, um, but it's not filling the gap where the service owner needs, which is on the layer seven on the service level of uh, connecting services. So I'm, I really love, you know, service mesh would get there one day becoming so boring as Kubernetes that people doesn't have to worry about debugging that sidecar, you know, worry about all the performance implication of that sidecar. Um, yeah, look forward to that too. Thank you. Um, Tim, last word. I get the last word. All right. Well, uh, I, you know, a year and a half ago at KubeCon in San Diego, uh, I, I made a, a statement that Kubernetes is already a service mesh. Um, and it was a, a little bit controversial then. I think it's a little bit controversial still. Um, you know, we're doing 
in, inside of Kubernetes, we're doing a lot of the things that Service Mesh does, but we're doing them at a, at a lower level with a, a lower level of fidelity. Um, and I think um, that's intentional. Like Christian said, right? We want to draw the box and say, this is how big we're going to get. Um, when you look at an API like um, Gateway, you can see where we built uh, in, intentionally extension points all through the API. It's a much more complicated API than Ingress was because it tackles a lot bigger problem. Um, but it's designed to be extended because we want these implementations of, of things like Service Mesh to be able to plug in at various points and say, you know, if I'm a user and I need to pop out to implementation specific capabilities, here's where I can do it here, 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 and here. Um, and I think it's really important because the, otherwise the abstraction isn't useful, right? Um, the, there are other things though that I think Kubernetes is not keeping up on and, and, and this is an area where I think we need to explore in the next year or two. Um, things like multi-network have been a persistent problem for customers like Telco. Um, Kubernetes initially, uh, you know, we put our fingers in our ears and, and hummed because we didn't want to deal with those use cases because they're really hard. Um, well, Kubernetes is pretty successful now, and we have to hear those users and those use cases that they're bringing to us. Uh, community came up with some solutions. I think we need to normalize those and make them uh, a regular sort of capability. Um, and I also think we need to look at things like um, virtual network functions and you know bump in the wire packet processing, even within a cluster. Um, I'm not 100% sure how we want to go ahead and implement those things. Um, but I think there's enough demand for it now that we need to start thinking about what, whether, and how we're going to try to tackle it. That's about um, you know time to wrap up. Um, I really want to thank all the panelists, uh, but but really want to thank the audience for such insightful questions. There are so many more. I wish we had like uh, you know much more time to talk about. Um, but that's uh, kind of a lead into uh, please uh, come to the Slack channel um, where um, you know the channel is. Uh, um, number two dash Q, uh, number as a number two dash QCon networking. Um, so, um, you know, I urge the panelists also to please join. Um, you know, it's going to be chaotic, but, you know, that's fun, right? I mean, this is the hallway conversation that we're going to have. Um, I close us to the hallway conversation. So, I want, want to thank again uh, all the panelists and really want to thank the audience for the questions again um, and hope to see you all in person in North America. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.